Welcome to the AMDA webinar, Needle Core Muscle Biopsy. Your speaker for today's program is Dr. Mark Tartopolsky. As a reminder, audio cast streaming quality is subject to your equipment, available bandwidth, and internet traffic. If you're experiencing unsatisfactory audio quality, please choose the telephone dial-in option. Operator assistance is available at any time during this conference by pressing zero pound on your telephone. A question and answer session will follow the presentation. You can chat questions at any time during the webinar using the chat window located to the right of the presentation. I'll now turn the call over to our speaker, Dr. Tarnopolsky. Please begin. Hello, I'm Mark Tarnopolsky from the Department of Pediatrics at McMaster University. I'm going to talk today about um, the needle core muscle biopsy technique that we use in our clinic for uh, investigating patients with weakness, uh, patients with muscular dystrophy, um, mitochondrial myopathy, other metabolic myopathies. So we'll start uh, first with the types of needles that are available. Um, what you see on the next slide is the standard Bergstrom needle. The Bergstrom needle was invented uh, back in the uh, mid-60s by a Swedish group that was investigating muscle physiology. And the standard needle uh, comes with uh, an outer trocar, and you can see that, uh, the third one on the bottom, there's a bit of a cutout there. That's the open port that the muscle goes into. And then the top of those three silver uh, things is what's called the cutting trocar. That is inserted into uh, the bottom piece there that you see uh, with the neural piece on the end with the number two there. And essentially, when you pull it back, what happens is the port is open, and when you close it, that trocar is like a razor blade, and it cuts off a piece of muscle. And then you remove that from the muscle, and uh, the piece of uh, muscle is extracted. The reason, I think, why many people uh, didn't like this needle is that the size of the sample was quite small, so people would have to wiggle the needle around, go in multiple times to try and get a piece of tissue. But as you can imagine, if you just open up that port, only a small fragment of muscle might happen to go into the end of the port, and so the fragment's quite small. So uh, the late George Carpati uh, certainly has advocated against these needles uh, in many of his textbooks, saying that an open biopsy is the only way to go. And I would certainly agree with George uh, if we didn't do the modification to the needle. So what we have done, and others have used various other techniques to enhance the quality of the sample, or at least the size of the sample. And what we have here is our uh, special setup. So again, on the top, that steel piece is the trocar. That's modified only in as much as the end of it uh, is drilled out a little bit so that at the end of that rubber tube that you see, there's that custom-made steel piece. That's machined such that it slip fits into the end, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. The next thing we do is on the bottom is that bright silver uh, circular uh, ring. That's a custom-made piece uh, that goes onto the end of the bottom tube there, and it screws in. And what it does is that little rubber O-ring on the top then cinches down and makes an airtight seal between the inner trocar and the needle itself. Then the um, uh, uh, hose there with the piece on the end is put into the end, attached to that 60 mil syringe. And as you'll see in a minute, when the needle's in the muscle, we apply suction, and that pulls a much larger piece of muscle into the end of the needle. So we get a much larger sample, which is adequate for light microscope, electron microscope, and we usually keep three other pieces for DNA, protein, uh, and other enzyme analysis. <clears throat> The inner bar there is uh, essentially a plunger because sometimes the muscle gets stuck up the barrel and we use that to extract. Now, um, if we move to the next slide, uh, superimposed on top of uh, my picture of the Bergstrom needle is what's called the UCH uh, or the University College Hospital um, uh, needle. If you take a look at this, it's essentially very similar to the Bergstrom needle, especially the end there where you can see it magnified where the circle is, uh, the inner trocar um, inside the port there. So in the inner circle, the trocar is partially pulled back, exposing uh, the uh, site where the muscle would be uh, uh, trapped or cut when you're pulling it. Um, what's different about this needle, as you can see, is those three rings uh, where your uh, second and third finger uh, go in. Uh, 
and then your thumb goes uh, into the um, uh, trocar on the top. Now, in this picture, we also have the plunger, which is obviously removed when you're doing the biopsy, and that's only to be used afterwards to extract the piece if it happens to go up the barrel. On the side there, where there's that little steel port sticking out to the side, that's where you would attach a suction apparatus to apply suction down the tube. The only downside with this needle is that there's a little bit of an air leak between the inner trocar and the muscle biopsy needle itself, so you don't get a firm airtight seal and therefore the sample is a little bit smaller. But we've uh, published a paper uh, in uh, Muscle and Nerve just last year where we compared the two, and the sample size is actually quite adequate for the UCH needle. I find it a little more technically challenging to use uh, from a dexterity perspective, and also to try and put your thumb on the little hole on the end while you're extracting uh, the, the biopsy itself is challenging, and therefore you get a bit of an air leak, and hence the size of the sample is a bit small. So moving on to the next slide, uh, what we have here is the actual technique, and I've got the references uh, to two of our papers. My wife, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Bourgeois, and I uh, published a paper on the biopsy technique in the journal Mitochondrion, and that's where this uh, uh, slide comes from. And then more recently, we published on just over 12,000 biopsy experiences that we've had in muscle and nerve. So this uh, goes through the technique in general. So in panel A, um, the skin is being infiltrated uh, with some lidocaine. In general, uh, what we use is 2% lidocaine without epinephrine. In some cases, we put a little bit of epinephrine just under the skin, but not into the muscle. We usually start with a 26 gauge needle to um, uh, go just under the skin, uh, just a half an inch needle, and uh, we do that mostly for comfort. Once the skin is anesthetized, then we use the 2% lidocaine without epinephrine and a 21 or 22 gauge needle, usually one and a half inches. The reason we switch to the larger needle, <coughs> excuse me, is that you can feel the outer fascia. So with my left hand in this picture, I'm sort of bunching the quadriceps muscle up, the vastus lateralis with my left hand, as I'm advancing that needle down towards the fascia of the muscle. There is a very distinct feeling that you get when you're going through fat and versus when you hit fascia. When you hit the fascia, there's a definite resistance that you can feel. And what I do is salt and pepper the lidocaine in a cephalad direction or towards the head uh, of the individual, uh, doing almost a line every one or two millimeters, uh, almost salt and peppering it on the fascia of the muscle. What we don't do, and I'd recommend people do not do, is to actually shove that needle into the muscle. It is unnecessary because the muscle doesn't actually feel pain. It feels more of a pressure sensation. And putting lidocaine into the muscle could disrupt the fibers. And once uh, in the clinic, we had a mistake where somebody put lidocaine on a, a piece of tissue paper uh, before we put the biopsy on, and it actually interfered with the histological stains. So uh, we would recommend that the lidocaine not be uh, instilled into the muscle. Next in B is the Bergstrom needle. Uh, this is now assembled with the um, uh, suction hose into the end of the trocar. The knurled ring with the little O-ring is now onto that trocar. And essentially the upper steel piece there, the trocar, goes into the bottom piece and with a little bit of sterile Vaseline uh, in between the um, uh, knurled piece on the top and the piece on the bottom just for extra uh, suction and to make it more airtight, we then screw it down together. And then we attach the end of the hose onto the 60 ml syringe. In panel C, I'm inserting the needle into the muscle. Uh, after having made an incision with a, a scalpel, usually a number 15 blade with a sharp pointed tip, uh, we go down, make a small nick in the fascia, and then with the end of the biopsy needle, you feel around uh, a bit until you feel the nick in the fascia, and then with a twisting motion, uh, you put the needle into the muscle, advancing about an inch uh, into the muscle, and usually angling it, as you can see my hands there, in a cephalad direction. So I go in almost perpendicular, then angle cephalad and slide the needle uh, into the quadricep muscle. I pull it out, extract the piece of tissue, 
when I open up the trocar, if I don't see a piece of muscle, which I gently uh, uh, take out with the scalpel, I then uh, take it apart, use that plunger that you saw in the previous uh, two pictures, and slide it down and check to see if the muscle has gone up the barrel, which it sometimes does. Next, you can see the size of the scalpel and panel, sorry, of the incision in panel D. Uh, it's usually about four to five millimeters long. Uh, we close with a 3-0 silk suture or a four or five um, in uh, younger children, uh, usually a single stitch. Now, there are some people who use stary strips, but in general, I find that they often pull open a little bit and the scar is not as nice as what we get with the suture. If we move down to panel E, you can see two different pieces of tissue. On the left is a piece of muscle tissue. You can tell it looks very much like beef. Uh, this is uh, what we would get from three clips. So usually when I'm in the muscle, I would uh, open the barrel. Uh, my technician would be uh, applying suction on that 60 mil syringe, and I say suck, she would suck. I would close the trocar, twist it slightly, open the barrel, say suction, clip, and so with three of those uh, slight twists at about a 45 degree angle, I then pull out the muscle and this is what we usually get. You can see here that this is about uh, 0.7 of a centimeter long by uh, almost a centimeter. Uh, this is about 300 to 350 uh, milligrams of tissue. Now, when you look at the tissue, uh, you will have some pieces that are uh, beautiful longitudinal sections, and you'll have some pieces that are um, uh, more of a cross section, almost like an end of an eraser. Uh, generally, what we do is we cut uh, a small strip uh, about three to four millimeters long and about uh, one millimeter wide that we immediately put into glutaraldehyde for electron microscopy. I then identify the nicest looking piece from a histological perspective that would be appropriate to put into optimal cutting temperature medium, which you see in number F there. And usually we freeze that in isopentane for um, our uh, histochemistry. Uh, next, um, we usually have about 50 milligrams of tissue that I put into an Eppendorf tube, uh, such as the one that you see there in panel G, and that gets uh, frozen. In an experiment that we were doing this morning uh, with older adults, we had a piece for light microscope, a piece for electron microscope, a piece for RNA analysis, a piece for enzymes, and two pieces for protein, all from uh, a biopsy and our success rate is about 95% um, on all comers, including very sarcopenic older adults. Actually, it's probably closer to 98%. So usually the neurologist, oh, sorry, I should also point out on panel E, uh, the yellow piece on the right is fat. If you see that, either you haven't gone deep enough and you're in the subcutaneous adipose tissue, or occasionally what will happen if you have an end-stage muscle, it's often replaced with fat and connective tissue. And sometimes you're actually going through the fascia, you're in what used to be muscle, and now you have just fat and connective tissue. Uh, usually if you put your hand on the muscle beforehand, if they contract and you can feel the muscle contract under your hand, it would be unlikely that you were actually getting fat and connective tissue replacement of the muscle and you shouldn't see a bright piece of fat like that. You probably just haven't gone deep enough, and you need to go and make sure that it's in the fascia. Having done two of these to myself, uh, when the needle goes into the fascia, you can usually tell, and the patient will say it feels a bit tight. Um, it feels like a cold popsicle in their leg. And usually they will feel this pressure in the leg, uh, and if they feel absolutely nothing, often you're just into the fat. Um, as I say, uh, we usually snap freeze a few pieces because we do a lot of metabolic work or even if we find uh, a muscular dystrophy with a novel mutation, we may have to do RNA work or protein work to confirm the mutation. So we snap freeze, uh, label carefully our samples, and uh, we put them in our muscle bank. <clears throat> in panel uh, H is uh, a sample. This is uh, an average piece that we would have. If you count up those fibers, there's about 700 fibers in cross-section. Uh, and uh, this is a little bit pulled over to the side, but uh, generally the histology is, is quite nice and you get at least 700 fibers. Uh, the other advantage of this technique is that we usually do the vastus lateralis, but in the clinic, if I, for example, have an inflammatory myopathy patient uh, whose deltoid is more affected, I can just as easily uh, biopsy the deltoid. In our hands, we have biopsy deltoid, biceps brachii, uh, vastus lateralis, soleus, and lateral gastroc. For most purposes, uh, the vastus lateralis is the muscle that we usually biopsy. Uh, 
Um, it uh, is rarely an end-stage muscle, but occasionally we have had um, uh, that experience where we've had to go to the deltoid. Uh, and for inflammatory myopathy, we often go to the deltoid because I find that it's usually more affected. And in the clinic, I'm sampling with an EMG needle, for example, with a new consultation with suspected inflammatory myopathy. If the quad doesn't appear to be affected by my EMG or clinically, and the deltoid is, I would then do my biopsy in the mid-deltoid. And the technique is very similar. Uh, the uh, location is in the mid-body of the deltoid, and we angle the needle uh, uh, anteriorly towards uh, the front of the individual. Uh, next slide. So this is the usual location <clears throat> that we use. Um, what a person is identifying with their hand is uh, the iliotibial band, which goes down the lateral aspect of the leg. You have to be careful of that because uh, it's quite thick, and it'll provide a lot of resistance when you're freezing it, so it'll feel like the outer fascia of the muscle. The problem is that this sits on top of the muscle, and then what ends up happening, you freeze the outside of the fascia, and then when you make an incision, you're actually going through the fascia of, uh, uh, the, sorry, the lateral fascia, and then deep to that is the muscle itself, and it can be painful because you haven't anesthetized that. Furthermore, when you do the biopsy, it feels like you're going into muscle, but you've just gone through the lateral fascia and then you almost displace the underlying vastus lateralis to the side, and it feels like you're going deep, but you actually uh, just get some connective tissue between the two. So therefore, if one thinks of the lateral aspect of the patella and the uh, lateral joint line, so where that person's index finger is the lateral joint line, and if you moved your finger straight up to the lateral aspect of the patella, between those two fingers, if you run it up the leg, uh, about a third of the way up is an ideal spot where you're uh, definitely into the vastus lateralis, but you're anterior to the lateral fascia so that you're not going through it. And that's the usual spot that we do in children and adults. Next slide, please. So here I have uh, the anesthesia. Um, initially, as I mentioned, we use a 26-gauge half-inch needle, 2%. Uh, um, you can use a little bit of uh, epinephrine if you want in the skin. I'd recommend not using it if you're going deeper because uh, you wouldn't want to get that into the muscle. Um, we've done a number of experiments. It doesn't matter uh, whether you have epinephrine or not as long as you're definitely not going into the muscle. But certainly if someone's trying this for the first 100 or so, I would avoid the uh, epinephrine until you're really comfortable that you're not uh, penetrating the fascia of the muscle. To the right there is a one and a half inch 22 gauge needle, uh, which allows you to feel the fascia. If we just use the 26 and went too deep, you can penetrate the fascia and you just actually don't feel the resistance. So that's what the 22 affords you, the luxury. The downside uh, uh, of the obesity epidemic in North America is it makes it harder for us to do the biopsies. And uh, we've had several occasions where we've buried the one and a half inch needle right down to the hub and we're still nowhere close to the fascia. So in those uh, instances, uh, what we use is a three and a half inch uh, spinal needle. So we use a 22 gauge, three and a half inch spinal needle for the obese patients to go down. We've uh, even had the experience where the muscle biopsy needle itself is not even deep enough to go down to the muscle in uh, some studies we did with obese individuals and we had to biopsy the deltoid because it was the only muscle that we were able to get the needle into. In general, per biopsy, um, I would draw up probably around six mils of lidocaine. We usually use about three to five per biopsy, depending on uh, how much subcutaneous adipose tissue there is. And I like to leave one or two um, uh, mils of freezing in the uh, syringe, just in case the person feels something sharp, then you can go and add a little bit more. I would say that the most important aspect uh, from the uh, freezing perspective is to wait a good uh, three to four minutes. Uh, we usually chat the person up, uh, uh, talk about other things, calm them down, uh, take our time getting the needle ready, which allows the freezing to kick in. I've certainly had the experience with a few procedures I've had done where people don't wait long enough and they immediately stab you and it's as though there's no anesthesia. Uh, so certainly that's uh, something you want to take the time to, uh, uh, to do. If we move down, uh, next slide, it says incision. This is what we call a stab incision. It's a little difficult to see the scalpel, um, but what I'm doing is bunching up the muscle with my left hand, making the incision with my right. And the reason I'm doing this is when I do the biopsy, I want to be bunching up the muscle. Uh, 
So I want that incision to be in exactly the same location uh, that we'll, I will be using when I put the needle in. Otherwise, if you don't use your hand, when you go in, you may make a nick in the fascia uh, that when you bunch the muscle up, it moves a couple of centimeters and you actually can't find it with your needle biopsy. So on the right there, you can see that this is about four to five millimeters. Next slide, please. So next, this is inserting the needle, whether it is a Bergstrom needle or the UCH. We usually go in at almost perpendicular and certainly in your mind's eye, when you did the incision, uh, you know sort of the track that you made so that you can insert the needle along that same track. An important uh, aspect, I've tilted the needle slightly so you can see the inner trocar there on the panel on the left, and what we want is that to be facing the femur. If you had the open port facing the outer part of the leg, you may go into the fascia, slide the needle in, and then if you can imagine, that port would be facing upwards and you might grab onto fascia and actually not get muscle. So we want the port to be facing in a, in a direction towards the femur to be deep in the belly of the muscle. As we move to the right there, you can see that now that I've gone in and I feel uh, this slight drop in resistance as you pop through the fascia, and usually the person will feel a bit of a, a pressure sensation, I'm angling the needle in a cephalad direction. So I've gone from almost perpendicular now to 45 to 60 degree angle, and the reason I do that is that the muscle is fairly thin. Even a fairly well-muscled individual will have a vastus that's only about three quarters of an inch uh, in uh, diameter. Uh, if we were to continue perpendicular, you'd actually be pushing the needle up against the femur. So I want to slide the needle up along the muscle fibers, and that's why I'm angling it in that cephalad direction, so that I can advance it uh, well within the muscle, but not uh, sticking the point into the person's femur, which is quite uncomfortable. Next slide. Uh, once we've extracted the samples, uh, we close with a 3-0 silk suture or a 5 uh, nylon or ethylon in a smaller individual and take the stitch out usually uh, five to six days after it was inserted. In the clinic, we give people the uh, small uh, suture removal kit with instructions to clean this every day. We give them our callback number in case there's any issues. In a total of about 18,700 that we've now done in the clinic, uh, I started these back in 1986. And uh, for example, in a research study, we do up to 100 per week, so the numbers get quite high. We've only had eight men who've had uh, a skin infection uh, from our research. And usually what's happened is uh, they don't take the stitch out in time or they don't clean it adequately. Uh, in all of the women that I've done, which is uh, probably in the range of 9,000 or so, and in every child, uh, and we uh, have biopsied children right down to premature infants, uh, we've yet to have a single uh, uh, infection complication. Um, so it's a very safe procedure. Again, all of these are with sutures as opposed to the steri-strips. And certainly anecdotally, uh, some colleagues who do exercise physiology studies and just use a steri-strip appear to have a much greater uh, risk <clears throat> of infection, which I think probably is uh, partially due to the fact that they're doing this in young university students who may not be as clean as we instruct our patients to be. Uh, but more importantly, I think the uh, suture opens up a bit and some bacteria crawl in. Next slide, please. So this is what happens uh, once we've taken the biopsy out. And uh, at this point, uh, what's happening is I first check, because twice in over 18,000 biopsies, we hit an intramuscular artery and there was uh, a fair bit of blood coming out where we just applied pressure for 20 minutes and everything was fine. But you don't want to turn your attention to your biopsy if the person is oozing a fair bit. Once in a while, there'll be a skin vein or something that you hit, especially in obese individuals where you can't see the veins. And we want to make sure that an assistant has sterile gauze uh, on that region. And uh, almost like making a fist, their hand is then underneath the sterile towel, and we use that just to hold pressure. So as I'm doing this, my assistant is holding pressure on the muscle, um, and we're checking to make sure we have adequate samples. Um, before we decide if we have to go back in and get more and before I put the suture in. So on the left, I've pulled back the trocar. Fortunately here, the muscle is right into the uh, open port and uh, then we can use the um, scalpel to take the sample out. Underneath the needle on the left is the cardboard piece that comes with most sutures. This is a highly technical, invaluable piece of material. 
the reason for this is that if I try to cut on a gauze or I cut on that green towel, I will cut the towel, cut the gauze, it'll get stuck in it, and it's a horrible cutting surface. By putting it on the cardboard, as you can see on the right, it allows us to parcel out the tissue, uh, pull it apart gently to find some good samples for light and electron microscopic evaluation, which we put in first, and then we parcel out our other pieces. And for mRNA uh, protein enzymes, it doesn't matter if they're a little bit what we call tumbled or, or a bit twisted or mangled. Um, it's more the histology that we want our nicest, most pristine pieces so that the uh, interpretation by the pathologist is, is accurate. And then uh, once we've cut up the pieces into the desired uh, size, on the right there, I'm putting about a 50 milligram piece into the tube, which is usually what we shoot for. This is uh, for mRNA analysis. And as you see there, there's three pieces after I've taken my light and electron microscopic piece and uh, sent to pathology. For pathology, we usually um, have a moistened Kleenex with some uh, normal saline beads on it that we roll up very gently and put it into a sterile falcon tube, and then it's transported to pathology where they uh, embed it in OCT. In my lab, we embed it ourselves uh, for research. Uh, we use screw top uh, tubes in the clinic, RNA free tubes, uh, sterile, and those are uh, cataloged and uh, kept for future analysis. If we uh, look at the bottom part of this slide, what I have is several samples. What you see on the far left is an average pass uh, with the Bergstrom needle with three clips. So again, when I'm in, I open the port, uh, say suction to my assistant, they do suction, I make a clip, I turn it about 45 degrees in a rotational fashion, do that again, turn uh, again, and take another clip. That represents about 130 milligrams of tissue to 150. To the left is the sample that one gets if you do not do suction. So what we did in our paper, and it's articulated in our muscle and nerve paper, is we took a piece of round steak and we did multiple uh, random biopsies with three clips with suction and three clips without suction. And you can see the difference between the um, uh, tube on the wing tube on the left uh, with suction and the next one adjacent to it, which is second from your left, which is without suction. Uh, the next one, which is second from the right or third from your left, is a UCH needle with suction. And then the far right uh, is UCH without suction. What this clearly shows is what we've known for years, and that is that an unmodified or non-suctioned UCH or Bergstrom is inadequate, in my opinion, for um, uh, neurological assessment. Um, but with suction, we get uh, much, much better samples. Um, and histologically, they're much nicer. We usually get a, quite a nice core uh, of uh, between 400 and 500 uh, fibers in cross-section. The other issue, too, is that if you need to, you can always go back in until you get the adequate and required amount of tissue for your experiment or for your uh, diagnostic uh, uh, procedures that you need. <clears throat> Next slide. So uh, these are just some of the biopsy patterns. Uh, most of you are familiar with these. Um, some of the patients and groups that we see, these are just representative uh, pictures of central core disease, ragged red fiber, uh, dystrophic change, inflammation, denervation pattern, and uh, Pompe disease. Uh, in our hands, uh, uh, we do a number of stains routinely. Uh, these are uh, core stains that we do, um, the uh, NADH, uh, modified Gamori trichrome, elastic Van Giesen, um, H&E, uh, ATPase at three different pH, uh, acid phosphatase, which is helpful for Pomp A disease and inflammatory myopathy. Uh, we've mentioned H&E. Um, we also uh, routinely do uh, phosphorylase uh, um, enzymatic stain, PFK enzymatic stain, um, uh, esterase, uh, SDH, um, cytochrome C oxidase for Cox negative fibers, um, oil red O for lipid myopathy, and um, periodic acid shift as well for uh, capillary staining and for glycogen. Those are some of the core stains. Of course, there's a huge panel of immunohistochemistry that can be performed on uh, frozen muscle. 
And for uh, disorders like inflammation, which can be patchy, uh, uh, we usually get it because we're searching for the muscle that we think is clinically affected uh, with routine sectioning, but occasionally deeper sections might be uh, required. Uh, which are very easy to do. Uh, from a needle biopsy, we can get many hundreds of seven micron sections uh, with, with no difficulty whatsoever. Next slide, electron microscopy. Again, um, uh, if someone's coming to a tertiary care center and getting a muscle biopsy for suspected muscle disease, uh, it uh, is inappropriate if a sample is not at least um, put into glutaraldehyde in preparation for electron microscopy. And in my opinion, uh, if you're biopsying a child, it is completely inappropriate not to do electron microscopy routinely, unless, of course, the uh, answer jumps out at you from the light microscope. Uh, the reason I say this is that uh, in children, it does take a while for the uh, histopathological consequences to appear. And often, especially with mitochondrial disease, we tend not to uh, see uh, morphological changes on light microscopy, but do see it at the electron microscopic level. Other uh, things in children, for example, like nemolin rods, sometimes come up uh, and we see them better on electron microscopy even before they're visible on light microscopy. And even in adults, we often get interesting pictures. For example, this picture on the left is a patient who had muscle weakness uh, and had features uh, that looked like FSH uh, dystrophy, but we were waiting quite a while for the testing to come back. We did the biopsy, and it uh, looked like freezing artifact on the H&E, but when we looked under the electron microscope, it was clear that there was membrane-bound glycogen which uh, allowed us then to target our analysis, and we found a, a definite uh, proven mutation for Pompe disease. Uh, what was interesting in this case is the person also was positive for FSH, so they had uh, a synergistic uh, pathologic mutations. Uh, but without the electron microscopy, and had we uh, waited for the FSH dystrophy, we would not have uh, got diagnosis number two, which in this case was Pompe disease. Next slide. Uh, people have uh, wondered about leg-to-leg -leg variation, and although this isn't in patients, uh, certainly we do find that the right and left uh, leg are very similar. In this case, we used older adults, and we uh, biopsied uh, simultaneously the right and the left leg, and we looked at things like fiber type and size using ATPA staining. Uh, we targeted a number of uh, mRNAs with quantitative real-time PCR, and we even did microarray between the legs and found that the vast majority of all of our targets were essentially identical. So certainly um, I would recommend from a clinical perspective uh, getting a muscle that's affected but making sure that it's not an end-stage muscle. And usually just by palpation and sometimes with EMG in the clinic, we can prove that that muscle is affected and that there are really muscle fibers there and then go for it. There are some people who use MR, uh, MRI. Uh, we never use MRI um, for muscle disease because we're going for the gold standard, which is biopsy. And in our hands, we use our clinical impression, the examination, the EMG to pick the muscle for biopsy. And given that we use the needle biopsy, which takes us about seven minutes. Uh, we're not waiting an inordinate time for an MRI to come back, uh, which gives you a nonspecific change and uh, won't give you the answer, and you have to go to the biopsy anyhow to get the final answer. But there are some who use MRI, and that uh, you know would certainly tell you if there was excessive connective tissue in a muscle. Uh, but I don't think it gives you much more information than just palpating the muscle and getting them to contract and using EMG. Um, next slide. Um, again, this is more for research, and I'll go through this fairly quickly, but we also were wondering about if we did multiple biopsies within the same leg. Uh, and in this case, we had 20 young men and women, and we randomly biopsied either the left or the right vastus lateralis, which we call V1, and we had them come back uh, a week later, and we biopsied that same leg, which was... Um, the V2, and at the same time, we biopsied the contralateral leg, and then we had them come back two weeks later and biopsied again in this uh, initial leg, and each of the biopsies was separated by three centimeters. And uh, this was for one of the studies we were doing, and we've looked at a whole bunch of other targets, including RNA as well as protein, and in this case, it was a POMP-A study looking at protein content and activity. Uh, next slide, so this just shows what we did. Um, uh, on the far left was the first biopsy, in the middle, we did bilateral biopsies. Uh, this was a week later where we did the right and the left leg. And then on the far left uh, is your V3, which is the uh, biopsy that was done two weeks later. Essentially what we showed, if we move to the next slide, uh, 
this is uh, Western blotting, uh, just an example uh, up on the top with the antibody and looking at the different isoforms. And you can see there V1, V2, V2X, and V3. The encouraging thing is uh, even doing multiple biopsies, you can see that there's uh, very similar results, um, uh, whether we do the right or the left leg or even if we do the same leg across time. And this is the enzyme activity. Again, slight variance between the two. Probably our biggest variance is that if we repeat the biopsy a week later, but clinically we're probably not going to be doing that. Um, and uh, certainly from V1 to V2X, uh, which is doing the right and the left leg, they seem to be very similar. And certainly for most myopathies, uh, other than, for example, FSH uh, seems to be one of the ones where we see big leg-to-leg uh, -leg or arm-to-arm -arm variation. Um, uh, the legs are usually uh, fairly similarly affected or the arms are similarly affected. So I don't think it really matters as long as there is some weakness um, or a clinical involvement of the limb that you're biopsying. Next slide. Uh, my suggestion uh, generally uh, is we pick the vastus uh, and or the deltoid as we discussed before. Oh, sorry, this is uh, on my computer. I'm, I'm going through it here. Um, if you're doing repeat biopsies, uh, the suggestion there would be to go uh, with uh, right limb and left limb. Um, uh, certainly going in the contralateral leg seems to give you the least variance if you're doing repeated biopsies for research. But I know uh, most of you are interested more in patient diagnosis where that's less important. So we'll scroll through that uh, to the end. Uh, I just want to thank some of the folks that have done some of the research uh, Matt Nielsen, uh, Aaron Pierce, uh, my research coordinator, and Linda Brandt, who's uh, my nurse, and a few other collaborators and folks that have uh, funded our uh, clinic. On the right there, that fellow um, uh, looking into the person's eye with the ophthalmoscope is John Sutton. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but he was the person who actually came up with the engineering of uh, our specific needle with that piece that screws on to give you the airtight seal. Uh, we he used to put uh, Vaseline in there to make an airtight seal, and Aaron came up with the idea of using a Teflon O-ring. Now, if any of you are interested, um, we can um, source out the engineering and make uh, the uh, Bergstrom biopsies for individuals. Um, in the U.S., I believe the FDA has only approved the UCH needle, and I know some places are therefore only allowed to use the UCH needle. Um, so uh, it depends on what your particular situation is, but if you have any questions, you can contact me and or Aaron, and we can uh, certainly help you with those logistics. I would certainly recommend if anyone is going to institute this uh, that they practice um, uh, quite a bit on a piece of meat. Uh, round steak seems to feel very similar to muscle. It has very similar texture, and it feels the same uh, when you're biopsying round steak as it does with the human. And probably the biggest factor, I think, in getting a good sample is the coordination between the operator, uh, the neurologist or geneticist doing the biopsy, and the assistant who does the suction, so that when you're in and you open the port, the suction is applied, uh, the port is then closed, well suction is maintained, and then the person who's doing the suction just lets go of the uh, 60 mil syringe to uh, offload the suction, rotate it, port open, person applies the suction, clip, and then let go of the suction. Uh, if anyone uh, is interested, uh, we've had about 30 different individuals up to uh, visit our site and learn the technique, uh, and in some cases, we've actually um, been giving grand rounds and uh, gone over the biopsy uh, with uh, certain individuals in the States, uh, Canada, and uh, Europe uh, with this technique. So if anyone has any questions, um, my uh, computer doesn't seem to be working very well, but I don't know if people can ask them directly and I can respond. As of yet, we have no chat questions, but for any audience dialed in, you can press 7 pound on your telephone to ask Dr. Tarnopolsky a verbal question or submit them by chat. As we wait for chat, for questions to come through, Doctor, mm -hmm. do you have any um, recommendations or frequently asked questions in the past regarding this particular topic? Um. Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> you never know what people uh, um, uh, what people come up with in terms of uh, ideas. I think where to buy them is something that comes up uh, frequently. And actually, on the Metabel website, I saw somebody was trying to find out where you can buy a UCH needle. <clears throat> um, I personally don't know uh, 
where these are sourced. Um, my uh, research assistant, Aaron, is the one who uh, has all of those contact details. So if people specifically want to know where these can be purchased, uh, both the Bergstrom and the uh, UCH can be uh, obtained in North America. Uh, and, um, you know, if you just Google it, you can probably find the source, but Aaron certainly has all the details if anyone needs those. I guess the other thing is, um, you know, does it hurt? Uh, generally, the uh, biopsy feels um, uh, sort of like a tight pressure. Um, uh, generally, with children, when they don't tense up and they're distracted, uh, they almost don't even know that it's happened. Older adults have a bit more connective tissue and they feel a bit more of a pressure sensation, but if they relax, it's usually fine. Once the needle's out, there's no pain. But then about 8 to 12 hours later, you start to feel a dull ache, and it feels almost like a little bit of a charley horse as though you're wrapped in the leg with a knuckle. And I know myself, uh, the next morning when you got up, it definitely felt stiff, and then that usually dissipates over 24 to 48 hours. We uh, usually apply some ice with a tensor bandage. Uh, some people have taken Tylenol or Advil, but that's pretty rare for folks to require that. The muscle itself uh, that we take out will grow back with satellite cells, and it's completely replaced in about uh, two weeks with uh, satellite cell infiltration. Thank you. Uh, looks like there are no questions from the audience um, on both audio or chat. Would you like to make your final closing remarks, Doctor? Uh, no, I think the uh, main issue is that the scar with this technique is much smaller than with an open biopsy. And in our paper in 2011, we have many examples, as I'm sure many of you have, uh, where the scar from an open biopsy is much larger, especially in children. It almost seems to grow with them. Um, and we've had many repeat biopsies. And given that it's relatively comfortable, a very small scar, uh, we seem to have very little reluctance uh, for people to uh, uh, come back if we need to, to go back in and do a biopsy as technology advances and perhaps new uh, um, uh, genetic tests or metabolic tests are required in the future. Um, whereas uh, most folks are pretty reluctant after they've had an open biopsy to have that repeated. Um, and as I say, uh, usually the vastus of the deltoid are the main muscles, but we can do other muscles. Uh, but if anyone has specific questions, uh, we've had so many folks up to learn the technique, we'd be happy to uh, accommodate. Thanks. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's AMDA webinar. Thank you all for attending. The moderator has ended the conference. Goodbye. Thank you.